This is What's New in New, Recent Acquisitions at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Laboratory of Anthropology. My name is Tony Trevoria. I'm the Curator of Ethnology at the Museum, and it was my responsibility to curate this show of What's New in New. So the exhibit is called What's New in New because these are the new acquisitions in the Lloyd Kiva New Gallery. Uh, Lloyd New it was an artist and designer and educator he taught for many years at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe and was an, uh, one of the early fashion designers, had his own shop and store in Scottsdale, Arizona, and still uh, serves as a source of inspiration for many contemporary Native artists. So we're here at a micaceous jar made by Dominique Toya of Jemez Pueblo. This jar is a, you know, it's quite stunning in its um, execution, um, composed of swirling ribs, which swirl up to the top. It's quite a stunning piece, and it became the uh, poster object for the show. Dominique is from Jemez Pueblo. In the past, their pottery was um, often largely utilitarian. With the rise of the potters at Jemez, starting in the 70s, and throughout the uh, 80s and 90s, they've been able to kind of redefine what Hamas pottery is. And in a sense, it's still being defined. They're taking inspiration from different sources and still creating what they determine will be uh, Hamas pottery. So this piece by Anita Fields, this bison figure from 2004, was a winner in the contemporary pottery category at the Santa Fe Indian Market. It is uh, made with um, contemporary ceramic techniques one thing that came out of this exhibit that was unintentional is the number of spirals that are depicted in artwork. And the, you'll see them in the uh, paintings, such as the ones by Linda Lomhaptawa, the Micaceous Pot by Dominique Toya, and also in this piece by Samuel Minimules, who is Dene or Navajo. Um, this is a redware jar from 2008, and it is a very contemporary, but constructed and uh, produced in the older techniques. So it's a nice example of tradition being continued, and so that it looks also very contemporary. So when you look up, down upon it, you can see the, the very well executed spirals up to the uh, near the towards the rim. So the neck is uh, slightly flaring out, and it has these really really beautiful fire clouds on the the uh, piece. This one is called Four Rivers, and it's a story of the um, migration of the Hopi people that, that had to you know, travel before we ended up where we are today in northern Arizona. The symbol of the spiral, the, the double spiral, uh, I made up of uh, the southeastern people, um, uh, which is you know where my mother is from, originally from the Choctaw people, originally from Mississippi, and they're moved on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. Um, when you see this uh, symbol, usually the South, southeastern people will recognize that, and it was a, uh, was a design that was uh, worn across the sash. Um, um, and I, so I, I put that in there to represent the southeastern part of the, um, the United States. Signature piece that we used in the exhibit is a painting by David Bradley, um, The End of the Santa Fe Trail from 1992. And it's, again, one of uh, David Bradley's um, satirical pieces where he's uh, kind of tweaking the image of Santa Fe, the image of uh, tourism, native art, and the, basically the, the way people view Santa Fe from within and from without. The painting is uh, quite striking in its composition and its color choice, as so much so that when the designers were designing the exhibit, they pulled the wall color out of the um, color of the highway that he used in the painting. This painting is from the Schwartz collection. And the Schwartzes were a couple who were downsizing after a lifetime of amassing a very impressive collection of native art in Santa Fe. Their collection was dispersed among the different units of the Museum of New Mexico. So we got um, a great number of uh, paintings of uh, representing artists that we did not have represented in the collections before. Now, the Virgil Ortiz Canteen is a gift to the museum. Uh, Virgil gave us to the museum in 2011 
and this was an acknowledgement of a small exhibition we did of Virgil and his family uh, where he replicated older archival photographs of Cochiti figurines and we used one of the cases here to basically replicate that but using um, contemporary figures made by contemporary Cochiti artists. Another avenue that I really like exploring is um, a little bit more of the sculptural aspect to um, different pottery shapes and these next series is kind of showing that sculptural aspect of my work. Um, I do also really like to play around with balance and trying to get something to balance in a way that it looks like it might fall over. However, they are super strong and sturdy and for the most part should stand for years unless a little kitty cat comes along and <laughs> knocks it over. Hopefully by balancing my pieces this way that it will make your heart skip a beat if you see one. <laughs> and, uh, but I do assure you that they are very stable. This piece by Ralph Aragon of San Felipe Pueblo. This is a polycone jar that has, uh, is, again, is uh, made you know, traditionally um, hand-shaped, you know, coil and scrape method, yet is, has acrylic paints. And again, if you note the um, spirals and concentric circles again showing up. And he has this um, underlayer using the uh, cream background, but also having the uh, petroglyph type imagery underneath that kind of float underneath the outer design, which is a little more contemporary. So again, bringing both the past and the present in one piece. Another gift of the Schwartz collection, Nakona Burgess, the Comanche artist who painted this Quana in red suit. Nakona Burgess is also a descendant of Quana Parker, one of the Comanche chieftains and who was also their leader during that transition period between the nomadic period and the reservation period. This painting by Marla Allison of Laguna Pueblo, Basket of Blue Corn, is from 2008. And although from the time that I'm speaking, it's you know, not too long ago, represents an earlier period in her painting style. This figure is also definitely my early work, but um, is now included in the exhibition here at the Mayak. This piece is definitely almost in a way like a self-portrait. I guess with the Laguna Manta um, holding a basket of blue corn, uh, this is kind of a mix of the time of pottery design, monochromatic, the excitement of artwork that I was still do enjoy, but this was definitely what I was um, in the moment of whenever uh, these paintings were coming about. Okay, this uh, piece by Anderson Key, who's also Dene, showing the uh, Dene co-talkers renowned uh, group of uh, military men who produced an unbreakable code in the Pacific for the U.S. Marines in the Second World War, whose existence was kept classified until the 1980s. In the exhibit, we feature two artists that we have had a long-standing relationship with, Robert Tenorio and Ambrose Atencio, both of Santo Domingo Pueblo. Both follow traditional conventions of the village, often including what is called a line break, or sometimes called a spirit line in the piece, where lines in the vessel on the painted surface do not connect or trap things within, yet they leave an open space for life and or, you know, or energy to flow through. Robert will often be very creative in how he places his line breaks and how they, they'll flow through the entire design field. I love having the stuff on the background. I, I think it's great when you have all the stuff filled out, the stuff on the background, what's going on, because it's like two different stories. You've got the story in the non-native world and the story in the native world and what it is exactly that's happening there. And here you can see I use this subtle shading, which is very unlike the, the historical work. This is sort of my way of doing it. A lot of people consider, you know, that Native art is crafts and not real artists. Well, I'm trying to say, yes, we are. I do do the shading, and that is what you will see in my work. 
is the shading and the super bright primary colors with lots of layering. This too has some layering. If you take a good look at this when you go out, I want you to notice the purple band that's across the bottom has been layered in several different colors. This painting by Fritz Scholder, uh, who was Lucenio and is titled Acoma Pot. This dates from 1968 and is an oil painting on panel and it is a gift of Elizabeth and William C. Overstreet. This is one of those unexpected um, surprises that sometimes happen in the museum. This literally just came in one day and was gifted to the museum. And as we did not have a Fritz Scholder, one of the um, renowned painters of American Indian art, it was great to have this in our collections and also showing something from the Southwest. Okay, so these are ceramics from the Martha Kate Thomas collection. That collection was a rather large um, bequest that I believe was 125 approximate uh, ceramic pieces. We have the Dorothy Terivio from Acoma Pueblo, one of her miniature black and white jars, and a larger polychrome jar, both of them in the wide jar shape, the very wide shouldered and the taller neck and showing the incredible um, painting technique used in producing the design on each piece. Steve Lucas, who is Tewa Hopi, is represented by a polychrome jar from 2007. A very good artist, he's very has excellent paint handling skills and will often uh, treat designs uh, differently. He'll paint one very traditionally and then the next example, he'll try and do something different to make it more exciting for himself, but still always informed by his cultural background. We have two from the Swartz collection uh, by Stan Natchez, who is Shoshone Paiute. And this one, We the People, is a really in incredible piece that you can talk about, about the different imagery and what it's talking about, especially for um, the younger you know, school groups as well. When I started painting on um, currency um, in the 80s and Elaine Horowitz showed my work, it was really interesting because people thought I was this angry Indian. And they had a special, uh, 2020 had a special, came to Santa Fe on political Indian art. So it's me, David Bradley, Jane Ash Portress. I'm trying to think of some other natives in there. And everyone kind of fed into this lady's hand. She was doing this 2020 special on angry Indians. So I had one like this, but it was on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So she said, well, can you tell me about your political art? And I says, well, my art's not political, it's educational. So everyone else fed into her hands and told her what she wanted. To, and she goes, what do you mean? I see the Constitution, I see a battle scene, I see the Bill of Rights. I said, well, did you know tribes are not covered under the Bill of Rights or the American Constitution? We're not, we're covered under the Indian Civil Rights Act? She goes, no, I didn't know that. I'm like, well, see there, it's educational. Cut, cut, she, <laughs> she didn't like it. She wanted, she wanted me to feed in like I was angry and you know, I just read Bear in my heart at Wounded Knee yesterday and, and that's what it is. So this is a bronze by Caroline Carpio from Sleta Pueblo, River of Life. This is a series of bronzes that she had did with that to have turquoise bead inlay. The turquoise bead inlay um, kind of reflecting that uh, river uh, motif that is reflected in both the design and in the title. The patina that was applied is also very well done. They get the gradating shades of the red and bronzes that are split by the meandering turquoise stream, if you will. Uh, Asa knew um, Lloyd's widow, um, knew of the artist, and actually when she was in looking at the exhibit, she saw that he was represented and she was happy about that. So that made me happy. We have a, uh, another a work of his too that is slightly similar although this one was kind of very more striking and has a really great detail work on the uh, necklace, you know, man is wearing. Melissa Malero, who is Northern Paiute, Rain Willow 5, 2011. It's mixed media, so it incorporates elements of basketry, which is a very traditional art for her tribe, with her own expressions in paint. A large carved uh, blackware vase we have by Vicky 
Martinez Tafoya of Santa Clara Pueblo. And this is another example of carved um, pottery, again, where the clay, as it's being constructed and, and shaped, the design is laid out and then carved when the clay is at a leather hard stage. Then it is allowed to dry, it is sanded uh, again, and then slipped, polished, and fired. The piece by Eric Tafoya, also of Santa Clara Pueblo, is graffito, which is different from carved ware, where the design is uh, scratched after firing. So there's also, there's elements in this piece where there's some modified carving that is done, again, before firing, and then the design is scratched out post-firing to expose the transformed color of the clay paste underneath the polished surface. He also created a small medallion design element that is a uh, part slightly oxidized as well, and that is achieved by reoxidizing the surface as you hit it like of a blow, little tiny blowtorch or acetylene torch, and you can reoxidize a spot. Martha Appley Fender of San Ildefonso Pueblo has uh, created this painted redware jar. The redwares, this one is nice in that she didn't use organic paint that is often seen on painted wares of the Tewa people. She used uh, mineral paints of different clay types. So using this buff colored clay along with the uh, reddish uh, slip. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a recent purchase by Roy Cady, a Dene weaver. Often the weavers are women, but Roy is one of the burgeoning group of male weavers among the Navajo people. And we have some really uh, great examples of saddle blankets, including a felted saddle blanket pad, which is not often seen in museum collections. So it's really great to have one of the pads of a saddle blanket also in collections that was made to go with another saddle blanket that we have here. The, those pieces that we, we have are from the Turquoise Cloud series. And then another saddle blanket that we have is Northern Lights. The Northern Lights piece has the hummingbird designs represented on it, which are also part of the Navajo creation story. So this particular piece, the words say, she makes America cry and asks, what's your number? This 18 inch by 24 inch um, ink and acrylic paint on paper was developed for a group show in 2010 in Santa Fe regarding the U.S. history of the Federal Bureau of Investigations in Native America. One of the things you'll know if you really look at the detail in the painting um, is this number 198198. And um, through friends of mine working um, on Indian law issues like Stan does, um, I had some friends who work with the Department of Justice, the Bureau of the uh, FBI, and they were able to let me know that this is the actual code used today for crimes committed on tribal land. And, and most of them are major crimes that the FBI investigates on tribal land. They have jurisdiction. If you look even closer on the, on the woman's forehead, underneath her hair, what I've depicted there in, in ink is a, is a whirling log. And what I'm trying to say here is let's take back our symbols for today's healing, right? Because we know this is synonymous with um, something that's, that was evil many decades ago. The seed jar by Joseph Sterno Jr. of Acoma Pueblo is uh, very unique, is very contemporary uh, treatment of the Acoma seed jar, so much so that its you know, design technique and painting style doesn't automatically say Acoma to the viewer. The Basket by Terrell Du Johnson is one of his newer works, which incorporates both gourd and basketry using bear grass. This is a very delicate piece in both its construction and how it you know, represents itself to the viewer. This water jar it is by Everett Pickyevit. Everett works in, again, a very traditional style, will, will construct some items that are very, very utilitarian, that could be used, but they also function, again, as works of art. Russell Sanchez is represented by a smaller jar with the Hishi inlay. Russell is known for using inlay, often in the style of the late Tony Day. When I was about 14, I did a really 
what I thought was a nice batch, so I put them outside my house to sell. Anita Day at that time had her studio, her shop at the Pueblo, so she came over and bought them all and told me to start taking everything to her. And so at that time I was doing really traditional black on black wear, which I had learned from my Aunt Rose Gonzalez. Uh, Tony Day was there working in the studio at her time at that same time too. So he's the one that pushed me to do more of the inlay and the sienna and take the same clays and materials, traditional materials, but to push their boundaries. The one thing that I was always told by my Aunt Rose is that, you know, do what you want, here's what we've taught you, but make it your own. Lately, I've been influenced quite a bit by uh, Japanese potters, mm -hmm. just the simplicity of form, shape, very hard to make, but yet they look so graceful. Sharp angles and stuff like that, and I've tried doing that lately, and it's kind of working. Lonnie V. Hill of Nambe Pueblo is known for creating his um, micaceous pieces um, to great renown. And this is an example of a jar we have that dates from 2005. It's also part of the Martha Kate Thomas collection here at the museum. And we're again lucky to have another uh, example of Lonnie's work in the collections. His micaceous pottery is clay that has a high co uh, concentration of mica in it. Some mica clays do not even need temper added to it. They can be used straight and then the resulting vessels are waterproof and they can make excellent cooking vessels. Uh, micaceous pottery often was seen as just a strictly utilitarian ware and it was through the works of artists like Lonnie starting in the 1980s that helped micaceous pottery be seen on the same level as other types of native pottery as both utilitarian but also as art forms. And it's his treatment of the clay that has really helped push that along. His pieces are very graceful and they have a very, very distinct beauty to them. And also that comes through him working very traditionally, including firing outdoors and getting, again, these very random yet still integral part of the piece, fire clouds, that become a part of the whole design. The Friends of Indian Art is a support group of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture and is organized through the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. And the Friends are a long-standing organization who helps support the museum in its educational mission through both programs and uh, purchases. So this exhibit we have here um, represents uh, 20 years of support for the museum and some of the purchases made through the Friends of Indian Art Purchase Fund. They represent both um, newer and older pieces, some that are very contemporary and others made by artists who have passed on. For example, the ceramic figurines by Pablito Velarde, which was a uh, great gift by the Friends Group to the museum through the purchase fund. There are not many of them you know, left in existence, so it was a great find when we were able to get these pieces added to our permanent collections. By the time I was about 15, I was sitting under the plaza on my own, um, selling little pots year-round, teaching high school. You know, just really found the art itself just so beautiful um, and natural that I never had any other ideas of anything else I wanted to do. That was it for me. Um, my polishing was real iffy, but I found that I could carve. So um, I think you push what you're good at. So in order to make my pieces look the way that I wanted them to look, I just carved the whole pot. I think, you know, one morning you wake up and you just start seeing things differently and you want to make your own designs onto these pieces. Um, it's kind of in some ways crossing the line because is it then traditional? So for me, I thought, you know, if I'm going to be doing this the rest of my life, I'm going to do something that I enjoy and my interpretation. So why not use what is around me and my idea of traditional designs? This set of silver and coral bracelets by Dan Jackson are pretty stunning and they, they're basically mirror images of each other. One has the silver overlay on the outside, the coral on the inside, and the other the coral 
sets on the outside and the inlay on the interior. I'm always amazed to see the people that come into your life and like how they change it. It's uh, the different doors that open up. I, I'm really thankful for that. When we do like purchase our silver and our stones, we, we try and look for the highest quality of all of our, our stones. And we like to use that into our pieces because, um, you know, I see our pieces like collector pieces eventually. Being Native American, it's like we want to be contemporary, but yet a lot of the colors that I like to use, we try and integrate like traditional colors into our pieces. I'm always encouraged to see what people are building next or what's new that's going to be out there, or even like new gemstones. Like for my jewelry, it's more of like the corn roll, the, the raised corn roll inlay, the integration of the different, like the oyster shells and the turquoise. That's like more of my style. Like the piece that's in the exhibit right now for the concha belt, that's the type of the inlay that I am more known for. I think one of the things about living in New Mexico is the sunrises and the sunsets. And every day the sun rises, it's a different color. And every day when it sets, it's a different color. And I always think like, wow, that's a painting like from God. And that painting was like done for me today to see. And so that's, that's why I think I'm more drawn to the, to the reds, the oyster shells, the turquoise, the coral, and the purple. Those are like some of my favorite colors. And then we'll um, use, um, what do you call it, sapphire powder. It's like, um, it almost looks like cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> they, sell, they sell it in like quarter, quarter bags or little ounce bags. I'm like, oh my gosh. Gosh, one time we got stopped <laughs> by the cop. And we had our scale, our gram scale, and the scratch. <laughs> oh my God. Like, I didn't think anything of it, but in a cop's mind, a gram scale means, you know, you're a dealer. So I was like, oh my gosh. And so he took our gram scale and everything, and I was like, why did he take our gram scale? Does he know how much those are? We need that for our turquoise. But I guess in his mind, he thought we were dealers. <laughs> the Tony Abeda bracelet with the masks. Um, this is apparently one of the last jewelry pieces he said he will make. He practiced silversmithing for a while, but he's still more um, taken with painting and other art and says he really does not sure if he'll produce any more silver work. So we're lucky to have an example of that in the permanent collections. During my second year at IAIA, I... I uh, <clears throat> uh, Took up three-dimensional arts and sculpture was one of the classes that I uh, uh, chose, and and I was fortunate enough to have uh, Alan Hauser as uh, as a teacher. He saw the passion I had in, in stone. Now this is the piece that's here in the museum, and uh, as you can see, it's uh, it's part lamination and part construction. Um, the bear is lamination. The, the, the lid that it sits on is lamination as well as the base. Now, the construction part is actually putting it all together and also creating the box out of granite and, and, um, and, and epoxying that together to, uh, to create this, this, this piece.